Good evening and greetings of peace. My name is Yusuf Ismail and the program you're watching is I Beg to Differ. This program focuses on interactive debate on socio-economic, political, cultural, religious issues affecting us as South Africans and certainly examining, unpacking and looking at some of the global dominant trends in the international community and the way it in fact affects us. On this program we attempt to get you to the bottom of the story. Today we look at the pernicious phenomenon of depression and what its impact is on us as South Africans. What are the problems that we face? What are the cures that are basically prescribed by the medical profession? And do these cures or quick fixes have beneficial effects or do they have long-term dangerous side effects leading to greater harm for the individual? Well, joining me in the studios, I'm joined once again after some time by Alan Warnitz, who is a healthcare nutritionist, uh, practitioner involved in alternative healthcare. Welcome, Alan. It's good to have you, and I beg to differ. Thank you very much, Yusuf, for having me, and uh, welcome to the, and thank you for the listeners to be here. Okay, good. Let me start off with this depression. This is something which basically is probably, I mean, in a recent debate that I saw uh, or heard online, uh, there's a raging international debate on what constitutes depression, what are the long-term users of antidepressants and, of course, other psychiatric drugs. Firstly, let's start off with the issue. This is, this is a phenomenon affecting lots of people it, because it's related to the mental health of the individual, because it's so much latent within the individual. It doesn't necessarily manifest uh, externally. It's something that would within, what's the basic cause of depression? What is depression? How would you identify it? Well, you'd identify depression as like a mood or a feeling. A person is not feeling happy, he's, not feel, he's feeling sad, feeling down, and he can't get out of that uh, mode. Now, now the, this is can waver and um, it, it's very much contextual to the individual. In other yep. words, various people have or um, give out different symptoms of this particular condition, which is not necessarily unanimous. No, it's like, it's a, it's a, as I said, it's a feeling. It's like, a, it's very much a generality. You can't sort of put a finger on it and uh, measure it. A person will only tell you, I'm not feeling good, I'm sad, and then you'll get, if they end up in a, in a doctor's room, they're going to ask them, how long have you been feeling sad? So if the person says one day, say, okay, there's no problem. But if they say, I've been feeling sad for like one week or two weeks, and they start turning it into a diagnosis, and turning it into having to name it as a diagnosis so that there is a reason to actually use a Is it a diagnosis? A diagnosis, to do a diagnosis and medically, it has to be done physiologically. You can't do a diagnosis on questioning a person. That's but here's the issue, Alan, because I know that there's an alternative view. Are you saying depression as a condition does not generally exist? Is that what you say? No, it's a state. It's a state, it's a state it's of it's mind. It's a state of a mind. State of mind state of the individual. Yeah. And, and this could be caused by different factors within the environment or yeah. external conditions affecting the person's life. Yeah, there's many causes that will, there's many reasons a person can get depressed. If he's in an abusive relationship and he can't get on with life, he wants, to, he wants to achieve... He or she, for that he or matter. He doesn't matter. Wants to accomplish something in life and is being stopped. He can get into... The, you know, you'll get into a mode of sadness or like uh, despair or... I can't... Doesn't know what to do. It can... That mo the mood can just drop. Um, it can be uh, under a form of uh, oppression at work. The boss is like really giving them excessive targets. They can't meet them and then they tell them, or else. So like when... If a person like can feel... Like if, if you feel like could, they could lose their jobs or something like this, how would they feel, you know? So you have these circumstances. And in my case, where I've seen this happen is more on the nutrition side, is people eat very badly. Okay, so let's just get this and unpack this yeah. quickly. In terms of depression pertaining to yeah. external factors mm -hmm. and the external environment, generally in those instances, would one be accurate in reflecting or suggesting that that's actually not depression in the conventional sense, but the state of mind of the individual is very much influenced by what's happening in the external environment. But, but, but that is now distinguished from a condition where a person is just simply sad and has a lowered mental state just for the sake of being without any external factor. Does that happen? I don't think so. There's, you always, you'll always have an external factor that comes into play for the person to feel... But, but, but that's the point. Don't they rely on the external factor as an excuse for their condition? 
That's what depressed people normally do. Yeah. They point out A, B, C, D, E, F. The reason. But in actual fact, those are not the underlying reasons. There may be other factors which are innate within their own uh, particular yeah, so what, system. What, yeah, this is more like a, a sort of a mindset now, not a mental set now. It's a mindset where a person uses that condition to get something. <laughs> they, let's say they can't get their way to get something. And they, they just, it's like running a, a joker card. Let me run that card. Let me say I'm depressed. Now let me see how the other people react to me and, and I can get my things. Children do that. They okay. do it in different ways. They'll, they'll, in their case, they can do a tantrum. When they do a tantrum, they get their sweets. So in, let's say in adults or something like this, if they're not getting something out of, uh, out of life from others, they can use that as you're saying. That's one way of looking at it. So we, one needs to also eliminate this, that they are trying to use it as a means, as a way to, to get something. So I want to basically move on then you know, just in terms of not the, 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 there's a situation where people are sad, they've got a lowered mood swing. They go to a medical practitioner, they go to a psychiatrist. We were going to have a psychiatrist on this program this morning at the last minute. She did in fact cancel uh, for some um, unknown reason. Um, but the general trajectory is that they go to a medical practitioner, medical practitioner recommends them to a psychiatrist, and then you've got a whole host of antidepressants and psychiatric drugs that are prescribed for the individual to increase their mood swing. Do you have a problem with that? Very much so. Why? Okay. L that's what I want to zero what in. You Why? Okay, so when and, and, and I'm going to hold you accountable on that point. All right. So I'm going to refer to the, the, um, this document here. Called What's the, a document? It's called the, the National Health Act 61 of 2003. Right? Yeah, okay. I'm so familiar with that legislation. You know, you know that one. Okay, so this is the act that every doctor has to, has to abide by. So in, section, in Chapter 2, Section 6, it says the user is to have full knowledge. So now, you go, to, now you, get, you go to a doctor and you're sitting at the doctor. Now the doctor must inform the patient. I'm going to read it. Okay. The user's health status except in circumstances where there's substantial evidence that the disclosure of the user's health status would be contrary to the best interest of the user. Must inform the user the range of diagnostic procedures and treatment options generally available to the user. Treatment options. They don't give options. How do you know that, Ellen? Well, let's ask a person, okay, let, we can go, let's say, what happens with, depressive, with drugs uh, prescribed for depression? It has, it, it has very bad side effects. S uh, suicide tendencies, violence, we've had murders happen, we've had, people, we've had cases of, pe of uh, people killing each other or doing mass murder. Are you saying as a result of these drugs that are prescribed? Yeah. Antidepressants, psychiatric drugs in particular, or general medication? No, no, the, we're talking about psychiatric drugs now, has that. I'm saying this because a psychiatric drug, these drugs have actually got a black box label. I don't know if you know what a black box label is. I'm familiar label. with that. Okay, the black box label is actually telling you that there's danger, a danger, that there's a potential danger by taking the drug. Now, those people who go and take these drugs, if we ask them, has the doctor told you, these are the benefits of it, these are the risks, how much it's going to cost, these are the consequences that would happen, do you want to do it? You know, what are the implications? Is that not in the actual, uh, when you open a medical a box of medication, you've got the disclaimer that's attached to the medicine, this long document, they, that is normally contained in that, and the assumption is that the user has that within his own particular graphs for him to make an informed decision. That's what's supposed to happen, but does it happen? So why are so many people taking it? it I, so we need to ask the people who are actually consuming it, were they told of these things? Because when they found out that these drugs, now they, they, the next problem that happens is there's addiction that happens with those drugs. They get addicted, they can't get off of it. Now we ask them, what, did, were you told that you could be addicted, that you could feel suicidal, you could feel all these things and you could be agitated, violent, and did you know these things happen? Were you told these things? We need to ask them, and the majority of the people will say they don't get told that. Why do these drugs cause that? The, dr uh, the problem with the drug is that it creates a deficiency in in nutrients in the body. When you have deficiencies in nutrients in the body, it creates those problems. It will create all the, you know, like the feelings, the moods will go down, or you'll have agitation. It, it's all like very different, you've got different symptoms that happen depending on the nutrients. I just saw some report here um, that I've got here um, arguing his case. Um, uh, there's a particular scholar um, who estimates that you know, as reported by the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, in the United States, 
that there were f uh, likely 15 times more suicides amongst people taking antidepressants, which issued, as you mentioned, a black box warning on antidepressants more than a decade ago. And the agency, the Food and Drug Administration Agency, goes on to say that it did this after conducting meta-analysis of hundreds of studies involving nearly 100,000 patients that showed the rate of suicidal thinking or suicidal behavior doubled amongst those taking antidepressants to 4% of patients, up from 2% of patients given a placebo. What do you make of that? Well, it's, as I said, Julia, the black box, this is where the black box came out. The black box is a warning, you know, by the FDA that's, that medication can, the black box is a warning that says the medication can stay on the shelves. However, there's certain, there's certain criteria that they have to be careful about. The argument is that the modest effect of antidepressants doesn't justify the costs that are spent on them by the pharmaceutical industry and by people purchasing it. But then what's the purpose of these antidepressants? Ubanol, Zoloft, um, Lilifloxetine. Do they not basically change the mood of the individual? If a person is down in the dumps, he's totally and utterly wasted to the extent that he cannot get out of bed. What does he do? Can we then basically tell him, look, we need good nutrition now. Throw away these drugs, get rid of the psychiatrist, and get rid of your medical practitioners. That's the ideal. Is that the ideal? That's so are you ideal. saying the ideal world is healthcare pro professionals and psychiatrists should be dumped in the dustbin of history? Is that what you're saying? I can say that, yeah. And on what basis can you make such a damning? Uh, that basically means an entire industry. The whole medical industry is fraudulent, corrupt, rotten to the core. Is that what you're suggesting? Yeah. Okay, so... Yes, is that, is that your response? Yeah, it is. And on what basis... I can support that. As, as a non-healthcare practitioner, how can you make such a damning I statement? I can support it. Okay, so I'm, I'm a member of the Citizens Commission on Human Rights. All right, right. what is this? The Citizens Commission on Human Rights is a watchdog committee that actually exposes the psychiatric abuses and psychiatric crimes in society. Psychiatric crimes in society? Yeah. When you say crimes, that's quite clearly a significantly harsh comment. But I'm going to stop you on that particular point because we are going to be left on a harsh note. I'm going to interrogate you on this issue because okay. I deal with criminal law daily. But we have to go for an ad break and when we're back, uh, we'll continue this discussion. <music> Welcome back to I Beg to Differ. If you've just joined us, I'm in the studios of Durban with my guest, Alan Wardnitz, and we're discussing the harmful effects of psychotropic drugging, particularly when prescribed to depressed people by psychiatrists and other individuals in the medical health care uh, profession. Welcome back, Alan. When we left, there was, a, there was a, a completely harsh statement that you made. You mentioned psychiatric crimes which presupposes that the medical health care professionals are themselves criminals if they're engaging in criminal activity. What do you mean by that? Now, I'm being specific now. Yes. Psychiatry. Yes. Not the other professions. Okay, so, so let's you be clear about... You, you, you're talking about psychiatry, psychiatry as a mental health profession, profession, dealing with the mental health of an individual. Yeah. Are you saying that is a crime? Yeah. On what basis can you make such no, a... The crime is, is, their, is their conduct. What they do... In their practice. But, but, but let's look at the definition of crime, a deliberate, yeah. um, intentional, unlawful act. Yeah. So the, the element of intention, the element of unlawfulness, and of course the wrongful action perpetrated on an individual, yeah. these are the kind of defining elements of what constitutes a crime. Yeah. Someone within that profession doesn't have the deliberate intention to harm an individual. So how could you make the claim that psychiatry is a crime? Okay, so this is from evidence of people having reported their cases uh, in relation with uh, specific psychiatrists okay, the, in that industry. So we could then argue that yeah. those specific psychiatrists may have yeah. possibly, yeah. probably end up uh, uh, engaging in forms of malpractice which may yeah. constitute criminal actions yeah. in those circumstances. Can one apply this label generally? You can. You see, what is happening is when a person get, goes to see a psychiatrist, they, they are working on labels. The labels meaning depression, o OCD, ADHD, all these labels are actually based on a checklist. In this, in the, is, is it in the Diagnostics, diagnostics and Statistics the DSM, Manual? 
All right. Who created that? They created <coughs> it because they invent their diseases. When you say invent their disease, that's again a bit of a damning statement. All right. Are you saying these diseases don't exist? All right, let me ask you a question. If you, the cell phones have come, have come to uh, are like a major, play a major role in our society today. We use it all the lot. Now, if you, if you start getting addicted to a cell phone, because you can't get off your cell phone, are you mentally ill? Well, it's an addiction. It's an addiction. If you're you addicted to television, if yeah. you're addicted to uh, probably all kinds of vices, gambling. Yeah. Does that make you sick? Well, I mean, it's an addiction. It, it depends how you define sickness. Yeah. So does it make you, you're healthy. You're a healthy person, but you've got, you're addicted. What happens is psychiatry now has invented this one and, and saying there's an addiction to cell phones, so it could be like a label now. And what, so that when that, you can die. So you're saying there's an, uh, in, in the DSM manual yeah. of modern day psychiatry, there's a label called addiction to cell phones. I think phones. They're, they're, they're proposing this to come, to come into play. If you go to the C uh, Citizens Commission on Human Rights website, they've done all their homework, they, they document everything. They will tell you where it's at, what they're trying to do. So I'm just giving an example of that. So now, you're a perfectly healthy person, you supposedly have an addiction, but when somebody says an addiction, it's like, it's also relative because it's like, that's an opinion. I'm on nothing, I'm addicted, but somebody else outside saying I'm addicted. So now, they, they turn this into an illness because the only time you can actually prescribe a drug, sell a drug, make the money, is you have to have a, an illness. So depression, is that not an illness? Coming no, back an, to... it's not an illness. So what is it? It's a state. It's a state of an individual, an individual. a mental health illness. Can someone be mentally disturbed? You can have a person mentally disturbed. The only role of psychiatry when somebody is mentally disturbed is when he becomes a danger to society. If he's about to kill himself, or he's, about, he's like... So, so, so in those instances, um, uh, medicine may possibly play a role. Would you agree with me? Just to suppress the, the issue, but not, not, as a, not as a solution to the problem. In terms of deaths, uh, I've seen a report stating that, and how true are these reports, that these drugs are responsible for the deaths of more than half a million people aged 65 years and older in the Western world. That's about close to, um, you know, 539,000, as some reports have stated, in the United States and Europe. Uh, and a lot of these drugs um, or antipsychotic drugs are used uh, to treat, for example, anxiety disorders, antidepressants, um, these are some of the conditions that are basically listed. Why is that the case? What, 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 what's the kind of chemical component within these uh, medical tablets that are prescribed that result in such a large proportion of deaths? Drugs have got the, the property of actually destroying your vitamins and minerals. They destroy your nutrients. Your body needs nutrients to live, to operate. Right? As a normal person, you want to have energy, you want to be alert, you want to be awake, and you want to get things done. All right? so, but your body has to be fed all the not right nutrients so that you can actually operate. Now, if, you, if you're not eating properly, you're not sleeping as well, and you're in an environment where there's a lot of oppression around you, all these things have create factors in the body where these nutrients start getting destroyed. So when the nutrients start getting destroyed, you start getting tired, you start getting foggy, you, start, you, know, you can't think clearly anymore. You sleep long hours. In other words, it's, it's putting a strain on you to operate in life at the speed that you would like to operate. So someone who's got blank state, psychotic uh, conditions, um, breaks down, cannot deal with society, yeah. uh, cannot deal with life. Yeah. So this, th these are probably the extreme cases. All right. What we're talking about here in terms of depression, we're talking about depression of people normal like yourself and myself, running through life, having a lot of stresses, not knowing how to handle it, and feeling depressed because... You don't know what to do. So if I go now, today, right now, you see me, I yeah. see you. Let's assume we both go and set up an appointment with a psychiatrist and um, we say we are depressed. Will that be sufficient for them to basically prescribe medication? Is that how it works? The honest one, I think, maybe tell you to leave because they don't see anything wrong with you. But the one who wants to make the money will find a way to make the money. In other words, to prescribe the drug and charge you and get you back. And it's a business. It's a business, it's a lucrative business, and it's tied with the pharmaceutical industry. So generally, most psychiatrists would prescribe medication 90% yeah. of the time, even when it's not needed. Yeah. What tests do they normally go through besides asking questions? They go through no physio physiological tests. Are there no physiological tests that can be conducted on the mind? No. 
Uh, how do we determine split personality disorder? You see, the mind is now going into the realm of religion. That's a different topic. Right? We're talking physiological here. Well, I assume the brain. Obviously, the, 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 the brain, brain has an impact on the physiological makeup of the body yeah. in terms of how the body operates. Yeah, your brain is a switchboard. The brain is not you. You, you the spirit, is not the brain. The brain is your switchboard. If the brain is not, has not got the right nutrients, what messages is it sending to the body? <coughs> the body, the per person can get agitated, can get very uncomfortable. And the mind now plays up with the person, can make them get that split personality. So do you see there's like, so yeah. if you're treating the brain to handle a split personality or to handle a, a person's uh, mindset, you are in the wrong game. I've got a, a quotation here by Dr. Ben Weinstein the assessment division director at Meninger Clinic, that's a psychiatric center in Houston, Texas, um, and he's an associate professor of psychiatry at Baylor College of Medicine. It's quite, a, quite an established institution. This is what he says. In general, uh, there is controversy regarding the use of medications. That's the medications we're discussing. And I think there's some concern about the overuse of medications and at times inappropriate prescribing. Um, but he says that, um, that more than a fifth of all health-related disability is in fact caused by mental health illness, as studies suggest. And people with poor mental health often have a poor physical health and poorer long-term outcomes. And he says that studies show that in certain instances, taking psychiatric drugs do in fact lower mortality rates, including from suicide. And so he says that it's crucial to consider the experience of the individual patient being treated by the drugs, that they do help in certain instances. What do you say about that? Because, I mean, this is the second program we're having. We don't have a psychiatrist or psychologist on the show, and they just simply haven't turned up uh, on two occasions. Now, I just, so I'm left with what we've got, and, and certainly we both are not healthcare professional medical experts, but the report, the, the assessment and the report says that yes, there are certainly bad side effects, but there's also the positive side that we're overlooking. First thing I'm going to take is that there's a bit, of, there's a flaw in that. What, did they, what percentage did they say? Well, he doesn't give a percentage. What, what 20 percent. He, he doesn't give a percentage. Uh, understand. I'm going to go back to the business story now. This is big money now, all right? They for create the pharmaceuticals. For the pharmaceuticals. GlaxoSmith, welcome. Yeah, they have to create. A situation. So now they create a statistic saying 20%. Where does this come from? I don't know. So then by that saying, they, okay, now there's a, they say there's a problem now that needs to be solved. Because in, what is business? Business is you find a problem, you provide a solution. They create the problem and to provide a solution. The solution is the drugs. So the, if they want to sell more drugs, they create more problems. And it has like, it has like, it's, it goes into a very bad uh, cycle because they created, okay, they said depression is a problem now, and then they, they say, they'll say 20% or 30%. So are you saying the illnesses are invented for purposes of providing a possible solution? The classic Hegelian dialectic, mm. problem, reaction, solution. Yeah. We invent a disease, and now we provide a solution for that disease, yeah. which is this medication. Yeah. But I mean, that, that's like a conspiracy of immense proportions. Yeah. And for that to work, they would have a multiple level of, of, of cooperation across the board. Is that even practically possible? It's happening. It happens. The psychiatrists depend on the pharmaceutical industry. Okay? The pharmaceutical industry depends on the psychiatrists. What the psychiatrists do is they go find illnesses. They create more illnesses. They find it, provide a solution, give it to the pharmaceutical, provide the drugs, and lobby Congress to actually pass it. And the people in Congress become CEOs or high-profile high people in the drug companies and, and swap roles in Congress and in the companies. You're talking about the U.S. Congress. U.S. Congress. Because all of this comes from the U.S. From the U.S., all this is, is actually filtering into the rest of the world. The United States is actually the testing ground for all this. So that's, that's what happens. It's a, different, it's a separate topic that you can go and research and find who is CEO of a company and find, you'll find trace of how they lobby with Congress and who is in Congress, who, who, has, like, who has ties. They've even, I think uh, Citizens Commission on Human Rights has even documented that. So this is a huge business, it's huge money. Even, even the lawsuits that have happened is like such little money because it's like part of a cost should there be a lawsuit. 
Well, I'm going to ask you to hold that thought. I'm going to yeah. go for an ad break and we'll continue this discussion. Don't go back. Don't go away. We'll be back shortly. Welcome back to our Beg to Differ, and if you just joined us, we are discussing the harmful effects of psychotropic drugging, particularly and its impact on depressed people, and why medical practitioners and psychiatrists are so keen on dumping these forms of medication on the population. Um, Alan, some of the long-term effects. I've got a medical journal um, in 2016, uh, Patient Preference and Adherence. They published a paper looking at what people taking antidepressants long-term had to say about the side effects that they've seen. Overall, they did say they were less depressed and had a better quality of life because of the drugs. But about 30% still said they had moderate or severe depression. And the main side effects they complained about was sexual problems, 72%. Weight gain, 65%. Feeling emotionally numb. 65%, not feeling like themselves, 54%, reduced positive feelings, 46%, feeling as if they're addicted. I mean, the end, it's the kind of a reverse situation there, 43%, caring less about other people, 36%, feeling suicidal, 36%. Many of the participants, of course, wanted uh, more information. And about 74% of people also mentioned withdrawal symptoms and said they needed more information and support about going off of antidepressants. It's quite damaging, damaging. Uh, and quite um, um, frightening when we look at some of these statistics and figures. Damaging, frightening, contradictory. Right. They feel less depressed, right. So in other words... But the argument is that they, 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 they should never stop taking antidepressants suddenly. Yeah. That's, that, that's, that's why they're having withdrawal if, uh, symptoms. That, that's, that's what the healthcare uh, practitioners in fact state. Yeah. So I'm going to go back to a statement you made, like you were saying, should, we, should they not use the psychiatry, throw away all their pills and just go on a nutritional program? And I said, yes, it's the ideal. But to move to the ideal, you can't get off the medication straight away because it has very dangerous side effects. The side effects is actually the withdrawal symptoms, which can make a person become very agitated and suicidal and violent. The, the, so that's the problem with getting off it. So this is where you need, like, if, if you're going to go the route of nutritional therapy now, where you're going to work with a doctor that doesn't use drugs to get a person off drugs, you're going to, it's a slow process, but it can be done. Okay, but now here's the thing. You, you talk about nutritional therapy. Where do I go as a layman to find out a doctor is going to prescribe nutritional ther therapy? Do they now look up for Alan Wardnitz? Alan Wardnitz is one in a million people that's involved in nutritional therapy. Who does nutritional therapy? How do you define nutritional therapy? People's nutrition differ from culture to culture. That's right. So now there's a problem. There's a big problem so we have to find because you don't have the void to fill in the alternative. You're saying this is bad and rotten. What's the alternative? I have solutions. All right. I have, I'm associated to a lot of uh, practitioners who actually do help people get off medication. So after the show, if they, if they want to get in contact with me, I won't, I, won't, uh, I won't be seeing to them, but I will maybe see what is their problem and refer them to different uh, practitioners that they can go and choose who they want help with. What I can also help is I can help with just like basic nutrition, just to get them their body back in normal, to just fill up the body with the right nutrients. So the body is much better able to cope with the taking of the medication so that it can slowly be weaned off. But the weaning off has to be done under the care of a practitioner. So I have looked at that problem and I know it's a problem. And I've, solved, I've worked on solving the problem to actually root, to direct the people to, the, to these things. Now, to go back to what you were saying on that, uh, at the beginning of this, this uh, you were reading about um, the people take antidepressants and they feel less depressed. And then you were giving me that list of all the other things, sexual impotence, uh, tired, what were the things? You there were was saying? basically, I mean, weight gain, weight gain, feeling emotionally numb. I mean, is that hap does that happen? Yeah, these when are you the take the antidepressants, it numbs your numbs, emotions. That, that's what drugs do. Uh, feeling uh, less care for other people. Yeah, so it's like an apathy. Right. So you're ap apathetic towards others. Yeah. You have no emotion towards yeah. others. So now you're depressed and you take an antidepressant, so you're now you're actually giving up. 
But isn't that what you, a psychopath is? I mean, a psychopath has no care for other people. Yeah. So does it so what then are we reduce now? you to the state of psychopath, uh, psych psychopathy? Yeah. So now, after this, so we are saying this, uh, there's a vicious cycle going. So the person now is experiencing impotence, he's in experiencing weight gain and all that. So there's new problems now and there's new business. So the person has actually given up all these uh, sections of his life where he could be active, caring for others, uh, sexually, or as I say, sexually active, uh, no weight gain. Um, what were the other things? You know, it's, like, it's the opposite of what life is Feeling about. Feeling suicidal. Yeah, this is the opposite of what life should be. And it's like, so now you've traded what you want for, of life, given it up, to feel less depressed. So here's the, the, here's the dichotomy is that yeah. if you're feeling suicidal, you go to a psychiatrist. The psychiatrist prescribes you a particular drug. Yeah. That drug makes you feel more suicidal. Yeah. Is that what, is that what the situation is? So you're, so you're probably prescribed So is that what the situation Does it make you feel more suicidal? So what happens then? What happens? Okay, now let's go back to the brain now. All right? I'm talking the brain as a switchboard. In the brain, you've got uh, nutrients that flow back and forth. And there's three things that, the, that you get uh, that happens in the brain. There's ne neurotransmitters for feeling good. There's neutron neurotransmitters for uh, being active. And there's neurotransmitters for moods. Okay. So all these three are three different things. They require three different nutrients. They require vitamins and minerals and require omega-3s to function. When you provide all of these, all these nutrients are there, you will feel Whenever to be active, in other words, if you need to be on the go, you're working hard, you're a, you know, like you're a, a, a very active person at work, you need that boost, you got it. So you need omega-3 and multivitamins on a daily basis, yeah. is that what you're saying? Yeah. These are things, plus your, obviously your proteins, because your neurotransmitters are made out of proteins. You have to have, you have, to have that provided. Now your moods also, it comes from serotonin. So serotonin is made from an amino acid, which converts into another, another component and turns into serotonin. And then the serotonin turns into melatonin. Melatonin helps you to sleep. In other words, it just calms you down at night to sleep and, and during the day, it keeps you active. So when you have a shortage of serotonin, what the drugs do now, they say, okay, they, let's put the drugs. It, take, it tells the serotonin not to be destroyed. It keeps it inside in, in the cells. Now the body's not, so now automatically the person will feels moods will go up, doesn't feel the blues. So that's why they said this thing is working. It appears to work. But the body now is picking up that there's a problem now. That there's, like, there's not enough serotonin being produced or there's, oh no, it, it realizes that there's a lot of serotonin but it hasn't been produced, but it's like sitting there. The body feels it's being tricked now. So it gives a command to the body, you don't need to produce more serotonin. So then suddenly your moods will go up and then it will go down. Now you start getting more depressed. That's, where, that's why these drugs are creating these side effects at the end of suicide and all that because there's no more serotonin, the body's been tricked, doesn't produce it. The drug is trying to make the body produce it, cannibalizes the brain. So it cannibalizes the brain? What do you mean by that? Well, the brain is made of protein. It so eat, it eats up the it brain? It eats it up. So can you see how this, uh, how this whole thing ha happens? And, the, and when the drugs are in the body, the body has also has to react so, uh, to uh, detoxify. I saw this quote here that since the late 1980s, again by um, Dr. Weinstein, America and the world have been enjoying the benefits of selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. SSRIs. Yeah. SSRIs. So what's an SSRI? Is that what you just okay. explained? Serotonin. Serotonin reuptake re inhibitors. Inhibitor. What is that? It, it, serotonin gets produced constantly in the brain. It's naturally produced naturally in, the brain. in the brain. It's a neurotransmitter. It transmits from one neuron to the next. And it creates some mood swings that's in the, the individual. Moods. Yeah, that's for the mood. So a reuptake inhibitor, what does that do? When, you, when not enough is produced. When it, no, when enough is produced, it gets produced and destroyed. So these antidepressants then, it, Prevent, floxetine, pre Prozac, prevents the destruction. Sertraline, Zoloft, Paroxetine, Paxil, fluxo, uh, Fluvoxamine, that's Luvox, uh, Cytolopram, that's Alexa, mm -hmm. and S uh, Catalopram, Lexapro, are among the world's most widely prescribed medications, and these are described as serotonin reuptake, reuptake. inhibitors. Yeah. So, this so what do they do? When you've got enough serotonin, you see a, ner a nerve has got nodes. A nerve ends and it says another nerve there, so there's a space there. In between that space it fires, it fires those uh, neurotransmitters. So serotonin will do the moods, um, adrenaline will do your activity, and uh, acetylcholine is for uh, concentration and um, focus. Right. 
So now we're back on that one. So the principle is the same. So in the end of the node, it produces the serotonin, goes into, and then goes and connects to the other end nerve ending. Now, if the body is not producing enough serotonin, you're going to feel the depression. You're going to feel the moods. You're going to feel down. You're going to feel the blues. So because when, and when there's enough serotonin, the enough comes through, connects with the other nerve, and it gets destroyed. So the SSRI prevents the reuptake. In other words, it prevents it from being destroyed, to reuptake it, to bring it, to bring it back. So that it, gives a, it, tricks the, it tricks that nerve to say, oh, you've got enough serotonin, so your moods are feeling okay. But that, that, that's the drug that does that. But there's no serotonin in actual fact. There's not enough. But because the body's not producing enough, because it, it doesn't have the nutrients to produce the How serotonin. How do you increase serotonin production naturally? There's a, in your proteins, proteins are broken down in 21 amino acids. There's one amino acid called tryptophan, which you get out of your proteins. That's meat, chicken? Meat, any, any protein. Meat, chicken, fish, all these are the proteins. Whey protein. Protein shakes. Protein shakes, whatever. You get, so that's part of that compound. Now, before you, the body can produce tryptophan, because that's the, that's the building block, it, you have, it ha your food has to be digested. When it digests, it breaks down the protein into all these 20, 21 amino acids. So when that tryptophan is available, in the presence of vitamin B3, that's why you see some, they've, in the olden days when they were doing um, therapies for uh, mental illnesses, they were, donate, they were increases the dosages of vitamin B3, niacin, niacinamide. The niacinamide is there to prevent the tryptophan from turning into niacinamide. So with that in presence, the tryptophan stays with B6 and some other vitamins, I think B3 and B6, it converts to 5-HTP. 5-HTP is a, is, a, is a stage of a compound before serotonin gets produced. When you've got serotonin, the body's producing enough of it, and then uh, for those who have a problem getting the tryptophan carried to the brain, there's a herb that they use called rhodiola, which carries the, carries the, um, the tryptophan to the brain for the conversion to serotonin. So if you've got adequate uh, serotonin in the brain, Number one, you won't feel the blues, you won't feel depressed, you'll feel happy. So these, these basically just create the illusion, in other yeah, words. Yeah. But what we're told is that these type of antidepressants are generally safe, but no medical treatment is without risk. Um, and when, when, when developing conditions like insomnia, skin rashes, headaches, joint muscle pain, stomach, and all the other conditions I mentioned, uh, the, the disclaimer is generally that these problems are usually temporary, or mild, or both? What do you no, say they're about No, di they're diluting the entire thing. Can I read you something? Sure. Can I read you what's well, 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 stop. I don't want you yeah. to go into something. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we have to go for an ad break, yeah. and I want you to address a specific point, and particularly the disclaimers. But we'll do that after the break. We'll be back shortly. <laughs> Welcome back to our Back to Differ, and we've been spending the past half an hour or so discussing the harms of psychotropic drugging and antidepressants in particular as prescribed for depressed people. Alan, just, uh, I had to stop you just prior to going for the break. Uh, the fact is that the disclaimers are always provided that these symptoms exist, but they exist with all medical treatment. In other words, all medical treatment is not without risk, but the long-term effects are indeed beneficial and positive and that you basically are creating a scare yeah so I, as i said to you what you said is they're diluting the whole thing all right they meaning the pharmaceutical the, industry whoever made this report saying it's safe it's like it's normal and all these things it's diluted all right this is nonsense nonsense yeah <laughs> i'll tell you why it's nonsense because i i'll t i'll i'll back it up but, but you, you do understand the responsibility because there are people out there that are going to be watching the show and they are taking antidepressants you're not telling them to take the antidepressants and throw it down no, the toilet pan or the, or, ah, or the bin. That's they dangerous. Need, that's dangerous, dangerous for them to throw it away no, at this point in must time. Must never do that. So, 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 so I think it's important that we put that out there, that no. we're not telling people to throw away their medication. No. Uh, we're having an academic discussion, something that is important, and of course looking at the long-term bad health ramifications. Yeah. The person watching it will probably want to get off it, which is fine, which is a good thing. However, careful, don't get off it immediately because the side effects of, of the withdrawal symptoms is actually very dangerous. To get back to you to say uh, th that the statements are diluted, 
Now, this is what they put in the black box, all right? Read and it out for us. I'll read it for you. Black boxes contain where? When you say black box, what do you mean? A black box is a statement made by the, by the manufacturer. It's a generic statement on the particular yeah. medication itself. On the itself. medication of potential dangers that are happening and the risks that happen that must be made known to the consumer. All right. And this is something that the doctor should be telling the consumer before they, the, they actually prescribe or before they, the consumer agrees to take it. This is, called, this is where they call mm. informed consent. You have to be informed about it, the risks, the dangers and all that per the Health Act before you agree to it. So if you've been informed and you agree to it, then it's fine. So, but if you're not informed, then you're going to have a problem. And that's, I think, many people happen because we've asked doctors, I think, why don't you inform that they haven't got time for that? For me, it's not true they haven't got time. If they inform them, they'll lose business. Antidepressants, that's on the black box. Antidepressants increase the risk of suicidal thinking and behavior, suicide, suicide, suicidality in short-term studies in children and adolescents with major depressive disorder. There we go, major depressive disorder, MDD. That's a, an invented disease, right? And other psychiatric disorders. They don't say disease, they say disorders. Anyone considering the use of Zoloft or any other antidepressant in a child or adolescent must balance this risk with a clinical need. Patients who are started on therapy should when be observed... Well, so I have to stop you there. When you say balance a risk with a clinical need, what is meant by that? <coughs> It's a bit vague, but I would say clinical need, meaning you've an analyzed the person, you've done an assessment, is he a healthy person or not healthy? You know, you, you do a physiological... So Zoloft prescribed for children? Yeah, let's say putting it there. Patients who are started on therapy should be observed closely for clinical worsening, suicide, suicidality, or unusual changes in behavior. Families and caregivers should be advised of the need for close observation and communication of with the prescriber. Zoloft is not approved for use in pediatric patients except for patients with obsessive compulsive disorder. So at the beginning it says increased risk of suicidal thinking and behavior. So now. So Zoloft is not meant to be used for on children. Yeah. But it is prescribed for children. Mm. So what's the implications of that now? What well, do we do? If you're a patient and you've got enough courage, you can take it up. With the, with the health professionals council to say that there's been malpractice, you haven't been informed of these things, now, you're probably, now they're probably having all these symptoms. But that's generic for everything, all forms of medication. Are you saying this is going to basically increase what, lawsuits? There's no lawsuits in South Africa against psychiatrists. No, there's no lawsuits. Nobody has taken up lawsuits. <coughs> what about the United States? Yeah, they've taken up. I've, got, I've, I've found two cases where they've, where black... Uh, okay, give, give us an give us example about what happened in those particular cases. Okay, 1998. Blacko Smith paid $6.4 million to uh, the family of a, fa of a father who, who killed his two children and his wife and killed himself. Why did he do that? Because he was on Paxil. So now the court case uh, came about, because, and as I said at the beginning, it's always got to do with informed consent. You have to inform the patient of the, of the risks. that. Was it have. established that Paxil basically contributed to him killing the children and himself? Yes. Because the, the verdict is, it failure to warn the drug could include agitation and violence. And they got paid. That's so one. suicide pulls, that's what yeah. they call them. Suicide, mass suicide, yeah. mass murder, mass murder pulls, mass suicide yeah. pulls. Another one, in 2010, there was $3 million paid by the same company to a widow. The husband committed suicide. What was the verdict? Failed to warn the increased risk in suicide. And the, the widow now won the court won the case and paid and was How paid much was she paid? Three million dollars. Three million dollars? Yeah. By GlaxoSmith. GlaxoSmith. Welcome, yeah. the famous pharmaceutical yeah. company. Yeah. So my argument Which is, is a manufacturer of these psychiatric drugs. What's your argument? What's your point? My point is, if they've paid, that, um, if they've paid this money, that means there's legitimacy in that these drugs are actually causing these problems and the, and the manufacturer who has a big pocket, who's like, is, has, makes billions of dollars, had to pay this, meaning that there's relevance in this thing, that this drug is actually causing this problem and has caused suicidal enough. So now how many more If there's a precedent for that, why are there no more cases? A lot of cases are actually paid outside of court. So there's settlements outside. There's settlements. Are you familiar with any of these settlements? <coughs> there's one that I came across, I don't know where to find it now. In South Africa? Not in South Africa. You see... What's the dilemma we've got in South Africa? Courage. But besides courage, lack of awareness? Lack of awareness, 
We need to tell people that... Because the assumption is that the doctor knows right and the no. doctor is always correct. Well, you know what's funny? <coughs> so I will advise a person on nutritional things. Just like the religious community, the priest is always right. So the medical health has become like a religion. The as, doctor is always right. As I told you, the, the name doctor is very well branded. When branding is done very well, nobody questions you. It, because branding got, has got to do with your credibility. So that the, the, the name, the title doctor in front of a person's name has given him so much credibility that people believe so much in it that it doesn't matter what the doctor says and they just follow the orders. The argument later, is that they've spent on, more than six years involved in study of medicine, treating the mind and so on. Um, and as lay people, how could we challenge that? You see, there is, a, there is a way of doing it. With, you can actually complain to the Health Professions Council. You can complain with there and submit a report and they will take it up. But it requires now a lot of... Uh, Driving, driving the process. Because remember, the doctors have got insurance. But you see, there's a two-tiered process here. We, we, on the one hand, understandably, all, medic, all uh, medical malpractice um, is negligent, mm -hmm. and certainly there are delictual claims. And we've seen this kind of delictual claims in the host, uh, you know, uh, against uh, certain medical practitioners in our South African courts on the basis of them negating uh, the Hippocratic Oath and of course engaging in practice which doesn't befit a doctor, that's on one level. But you're not talking about that. You're talking about an industry here. Mm. What you're saying is that the entire industry at its fundamental level, even if the practitioner just simply follows that industry to the best of his ability, that is indeed rotten to the core. And that's what you're questioning, yeah. which is a totally different ball game entirely. Yeah, so just, just to give you, an, just to illustrate how rotten it is, if you heard of uh, Professor Noakes. Tim Noakes. Tim Noakes, right? Professor Noakes from the University of Cape Town, he was being uh, challenged for his statements that he made about uh, nutritional therapies. You know, on the, well, he on was the, prescribing a high-fat, low-carbohydrates yeah. diet. Right. So it upset... Which is an opinion, again, yeah. expressed by him. Yeah. So it, it, upset, it upset that industry where they took him up to the HPCSA, the Health Profession Council. Right? It took him two years. He won the case. In other words, there was nothing, to, nothing that he did that was wrong. He was just upsetting the system that um, it's like a, it's creating, there's so much money being made by the system that he would come and upset it. Because he was upsetting the diabetic system. In diabetes, there's a hell of a lot of money in diabetic drugs. And he's coming to tell you, eat healthy, and you won't need these drugs anymore. So what is that doing? So they felt threatened. And how I, how I know that as well is his peers at the university where he worked with them for 20 or 30 years didn't even defend him anymore. It's like they want nothing to do with him. So you've got, you've got that dilemma where if you do not fit in the system, you will lose all your privileges. Professor Noakes is strong enough to like say, you know what, I don't, if I disagree with it, my integrity is there to tell you that I disagree with it. And this is what I know works, has worked, and, and he's been training a lot of practitioners now and training them how to help patients on the diabetic side. So we can take that same example now on the, on the depression side in psychiatry, is to, is to alert the people that there's other ways of, of help, of dealing with, with depression. You don't need to go to psychiatrists because you're going to get, you know, you'll get into trouble. What, a, what happens to the psychiatric industry then? It, should, it must die. What happens to psychiatrists? Then they as must a go profession. find another job. Is, is it that simplistic? That well, they just need to go and find another job what and am get I rid say? of the industry? What, what solution? Are they providing a solution that actually gets, gets results or are they providing a solution which creates more problems? Are you saying there's no results being provided there's whatsoever? There's no results. They must come to me and show me the results. They must come well, we've to, called they must come them to on the, the show before. We've called psychiatrists okay, on the show twice let, yeah. and they haven't come. Let's say the program. results. We, there's the results there. All right. Would you like to be a person who feels depressed, less depressed, but sexually inactive, can't be sexually active? Um, weight gain, all these things that you're saying, would you like to trade for that? Is that what his life is about? Would that mean that you've weight got Weight gain, numbing of the numbing, senses? Numbing, being numb, not feeling anything anymore. Feeling suicidal, you're, you're not a father, feeling care for you anybody else. You don't care about your child growing? Is that what happens? Well, is that, is that, well that's the result. Is that, a good, is that a good result? So this is where my question is. This is not a result. The result I want is I want to feel young. I want to feel energetic. I want to feel active you know, sexually active, whatever it is, as if I was 20 years old, doesn't matter if I'm 50 or 60. That's what one is striving for. But, uh, but you run into life, you, got, you get knocks in life, you get, you'll have a boss that nails, that like hammers you, you'll have abuse at home, or you'll have an uncle that's giving you trouble, or you, 
You know, you're taking drugs because you've been influenced. Now you feel the blues and all that. It's like you want to get out of it. You've got the alternative nutritional health care. Yeah. How do people contact you should they wish to contact you? Do you have an email address? We could put it on the screen. Yeah, I've got an email address. What's the email address? It's Alan, A-L-L-A-N. A-L-L-A-N. At maxup, M-A-X-U-P. At maxup, M-A-X-U-P. Dot C-O dot Z-A. So it's Alan at maxup dot C-O dot Z-A. Yeah. Yeah. And what, what do they, and, and, and they contact you in the event that they've got. Um, They'll contact me. That's fine. I will what, 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 are you, what, are you, what are you offering them? What are you offering the viewers out there? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see what they, you see, I have to assess what their problem is before I can give them a solution. And I will, they will, I will assess what their problem is. I will, I will sort of, I will not do any phone calls, but I'll just correspond on email, find what their problem is, where they stay, et cetera, in the, which areas, and find people in their area that could be of help to them. Are you a quack? That's an opinion. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're providing an alternative to yeah. the psychiatry industry. Yeah. So I could, be, I could be the person who's like genuinely giving, getting results, and I could call the psychiatrist the quack. That's why I said, like, whose opinion is it? Because they're there, because they're funded, and they've got a lot of money, and the pharmaceuticals are funding them because they're making a ton of money, and there's other agendas behind it, which you know we've spoken about it, which we're not going into. So they are established now. They're branded. So if I do an alternative, yes, I'll be a quack. But if I get results which the people are wanting, which gets them back their energies to the, like even if you're 60-year-old and you're feeling down and you've got all your joint pains, you can't run, you can't play rugby or you can't play soccer, whichever, you know, the things that you love to do, you've got no time for the children because you're so tired. If I can give you back that life without the use of medication, feeling less depressed and having all the other symptoms you were mentioning about, which way would you go? So... As you said, being a quack is, is a very relative word. Well, that's it. It, just, uh, it depends on the choice of so the person. So if they need to get you to Alan at maxup.co.za. Yeah. I want to thank you, Alan Warnett. Yeah. It's been good having you again you. once on I Beg to Differ. Uh, we hope to have further engagements with you in the near future. And if you've just been watching us, you've been seeing I Beg to Differ. The program has been focusing on the harmful effects of psychotropic drugging and certainly looking at some of the alternatives. And join us next week for more interactive discussion and debate getting you to the bottom of the story on I Beg to Differ. If you're traveling, travel safely to your destination and have a good evening.